Good morning, my name is Andrew. I'm the Family Life Pastor here at Lake City Church and I'm so excited to be with you this morning. Um, not only do, uh, did we get to do child dedications, but I get to talk to you about community. And last week, Mitch said that he won the lottery in talking about the Holy Spirit, but he was wrong. I won the lottery because community is the best thing that I could have ever talked about. And I'm really excited this morning because there are so many things, you know, that even were written down last week. We, as a staff, have been praying over these red sticky notes every single week. They get typed out, sent to the whole staff. And there are so many things that are going on and it's such a good reminder, like Nick's story, like God is active, God is working. You know, the things that were written down about being alone, about being isolated, God is with you. In those seasons of waiting, God is with you. And there's a lot on here that I can really resonate. Uh, things like, I feel alone in parenting. Whew. Strength to stay loving and gentle with my kids. I feel that. Strength to be the mom I was called to be. I need to see God's faithfulness in how to father my two kids. You know, these are things that resonate with me, especially in working with families. And I want you to know, I want you to be aware that we are so dedicated to families here at Lake City. Not only like this morning with child dedications, but we have things like Moms Connect that goes on. We've got fun things like our trunk or treat event in a couple weeks, our gingerbread event a few weeks after that. And then something I'm really, really excited about is we're gonna be flying in some individuals to speak on some really specific topics. Things like technology, guard, healthy guardrails and guidelines, gender and sexuality, and mental health things that our parents, our kids are facing. We wanna have biblically-based conversations that are gonna help parents really help, feel them, uh, help them feel resourced and equipped into having these meaningful conversations. And so I want you to know, one, you're not alone. We're with you, but there are some exciting things ahead. We got some exciting uh, events planned. But I'm gonna run out of time this morning because I think I took too long during the child dedication, so we gotta jump in. Listen, we are gonna be in Acts 2, 42 through 47. I have got 30, mm, 27 minutes to do these six verses and we are gonna have some fun. So buckle in, I work with kids, so I'm gonna talk fast, keep your ears open, attentive, right? Lean forward, let's do this. Okay, here's the thing, quick recap. Last week, Mitch talked about the Holy Spirit. Listen, this is like, you know how if you've ever been to college and there was like a required reading list? That was a required message. If you heard it last week, you're good to go. If you didn't, you need to listen to it because he sets up historically how the Holy Spirit has been there from the beginning, the importance of it. He talks about the temple, the curtain, it being torn, God's presence with us. This is so vital because as we talk about what it means to be the church, what it means to be a community of faith, a Christ-centered community. This could not happen apart from the working and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit for what we're doing. Because everything we talk about today, that is the set up. This would not have happened if the Holy Spirit was not indwelling, a part of empowering the people that we are about to speak on. And so last week, it ended with this idea of uh, Peter gets up, empowered by the Holy Spirit, tells the people, turn from your wicked ways. They thought they were all drunk, and he's like, not a chance, stop sinning. And then it says they were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Okay, let's go. Acts 2, 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. This is incredible. So the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, 3,000 are added and immediately what begins to take place and what we see happen is the church. We see community unfold. I love how it lays this out when it talks about the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, prayer. These are things that I personally really enjoy. I don't know if you've ever been through seasons like we've even mentioned in the sticky notes, seasons of waiting, seasons of doubt, seasons of difficulty. Just you feel like you're not, like you're treading water and you're just really not getting anywhere. And for me, what this feels like is a great checkup it feels like I'm checking the meters on how I'm doing because when I go through those seasons and I'm just feeling kind of blah, it's helpful for me to have something that I go back to, 
that I can check in my own life and see, okay, am I engaging in these things? When he talks about teaching, am I engaged in biblical teaching? On Sunday morning, this is part of it. Are there books, are there podcasts, are there other ways that I am getting those resources and being equipped? Fellowship, am I with other believers, like-minded people who understand that they also should be engaged in these things? The breaking of bread and prayer, these are liturgical things. The breaking of bread, uh, bread is referencing communion, right? What Jesus put in place, do this in remembrance of me. And the prayers, these are things that would be repeated. The Lord's Prayer, our Father in heaven, holy is your name. These are things that we can go back to and they feel like healthy points to check on how we're doing and if we're actually engaged in community. And so then it continues though. Here's something interesting I found as I was reading this. In the Greek, what Luke uses here is a word, to a verb to actually help it reinforce these things. He uses the word proskarterio. It means devoted. So we see here that they were devoted, not just to teaching, but it references to all. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to fellowship. They were devoted to the breaking of bread and prayer. And here's what it actually defines it in the Greek. Consistently showing strength, which prevails, in spite of difficulties, to endure, remain firm, staying in a fixed direction. That idea of in spite of difficulties. Here's the thing. The difficulties that we face and the early church faced are often a little different. You know, when I think about the early church and the persecution that took place, when it says, in spite of difficulty, commit to teaching and fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayers, it hits me a little different because I often feel like the difficulties that I feel like I'm facing are mostly self-imposed. You know, when I think about if I'm not engaging in these things well, I'm like, oh, I just don't have the time. The early church was like, I think we might be murdered. I'm like, I don't have the time. <sighs> it's difficult. I've got two soccer practices today. How could I ever engage in fellowship? And listen, I don't wanna belittle or demean the things that we face. There are true difficulties we face. But I do wanna shine a light in the idea that we often self-impose the difficulties rather than truly engaging in what it means to be a part of a faith-based community, a Christ-centered community. And when I read this, I, I'm often thinking like, okay, I'm engaged in community, but I'm not fully engaged in community the way that I think God actually intended. Have you ever, by chance, purchased something, used it maybe for months or years, but never actually fully utilized it? Like, okay, some of you, maybe you have a membership to the Croc Center and like you use the pool, but there's like a workout area and there's basketball. Like there's all these things, right? Or some of you buy items and like, okay, maybe you have a DVD player. It's played DVDs for two decades, but there's still blinking zero lights because you've never set the clock, right? And there's another whole nother function. Okay, something that's a little, that's a little slightly embarrassing. I've already been made fun of by some staff members and so now I'm gonna bring you in on it. There's an item that I've been using for basically two decades. I use this item almost every single day. And the problem, why it's embarrassing, is because almost all of you use this item every single day as well. And when I show it to you, if you know, you know. You're gonna see it, because really, you think there's only one function, but there's two. And you're, gonna, you're already gonna know. And some of you might actually not know the second function. And so we'll have solace together. Do you, do you know what this is? this is? This is a rear view mirror. This is, okay, some of you know. Some of you know. Okay, so in, in my car for the last two decades, this has sat as such and it's been used as such. Two months ago, I walked out of my office to Pastor Jared, I was like, Jared, do you know what, do you know there's a, like another function? And he's like, yeah. How cool is that? Here's the problem. You might be thinking, Andrew, you don't, you look like a sharp guy, right? You don't seem completely unaware. Here's how I've been using this. I've been married for 13 years. My wife is about six inches shorter than me. In our car, when she gets in, she can flip down and it works. So I just thought it's meant for married couples that, One's taller than the other, and you can. It's okay, I'm responsible for your children. It's all fine. 
it's all fine. You see, I think in the same way that there are things in this world that we just don't fully utilize, community is the same. Just by being here this morning, you are engaged at least partially in community. But what I believe God is pulling us to and trying to uncover and help us understand is that there is a greater way that we are supposed to be involved, to be engaged in community. And it begins here with routines and rhythms, things like being devoted to teaching, devoted to fellowship, devoted to the breaking of bread and prayers, in spite of difficulty, in spite of difficulty. And then God begins to do incredible things. It says that they saw wonders and signs. And there's something that really stood out to me here because in the Greek, signs is translated as something that brings glory to God. And as I was just kind of praying about this passage, what really stood out to me and what I felt challenged by was this idea that signs isn't something just um, some miraculous thing that we could never comprehend, but it's actually just something that brings glory to God. And here was the conviction that I felt when I was reading this, is that there are oftentimes in my life, even in the church, even as I'm engaged in some of these things that we're supposed to be doing, where I feel like I have come into contact with a coincidence, Here's what I mean by this. I'll be you know, at the grocery store. I'll run into somebody I haven't seen in a while. Be like, hey, how's it going? Oh, I haven't seen you. How's the family? And all of a sudden, conversation begins to like head towards how their family's doing, the health of what's going on, and their faith. And a meaningful conversation takes place. And I walk away and I'm like, what a cool coincidence. Wasn't that awesome? And what I felt convicted as I was reading this and looking at what this means in the Greek, it's a sign. A sign is something that brings glory to God. And I had this heart check of just like, I'm not recognizing God moving in my daily life like I should be. Things that I've been chalking up to coincidences are actually signs. These conversations that sometimes I just feel like, well, wasn't that kind of cool? No, those are moments where God is actually working. You see, we live with the same empowerment of the Holy Spirit that the first century church did. So God is not moving any less. I just think we often recognize less of what he's doing. And I just felt this challenge of like, I need to be better present and have a better perspective knowing that God is active and am I recognizing the wonders and signs that are around me? Because then I can give proper glory to God for the signs that are taking place. So these are taking place, these rhythms and routines, these signs, these wonders are happening. And we find ourselves in verse 44 where it says this, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Now, upon first reading this, 45 stands out and seems like, whew, this is like the rich young ruler coming to Jesus and like sell everything kind of moment. And like, oh, Jesus, do I have to? <laughs> like, you know, it feels really convicting and challenging because what took place was true community, a true care about the needs of all that were present. And yet, as I read this, I kept getting stuck on verse 44. I just couldn't get past because it was bugging me. You know, when it says that all who believed were together and had all things in common, I was like, no, they didn't. What are you talking about? Because if I were to look at a group and say, do they have all things in common? Here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, okay, maybe this is people who like the same kind of music the same sports, you know, they're dressing the same, they're engaged in the same things. You show up somewhere, everyone is wearing a red hat, you know what's going on, you know, it's like you can put two and two together. You see and you think, okay, they have all things in common, but that's not happening here. Last week as Mitch was reading the prior chapter, it starts in uh, verse five of chapter two, and it says that the people that were gathered were from all nations under heaven, and there's over 15 different categories, I won't read them, but they were from, they were from all over. So what's going on here? You have people essentially from all parts of the known world in that space, and that means that you've got slaves and masters, people are part of different economical statuses, races, classes, genders. I mean, this is a diverse group, if there was a diverse group. And yet it says all who believed were together and had all things in common. What is going on? Okay, so here's what's going on. Luke, in the Greek, uses this word for when it says they had all things in common. And it's this, koinos, koinos. Here's the definition. Typically refers to spiritual desecration. This happens when a person treats what is sacred as ordinary. 
This happens when a person treats what is sacred or set apart by God, and now they treat it as ordinary. Or as a continued definition says, stripped of all specialness. Okay, so what is what does this mean? Why is Luke, I mean, this is an abrasive term. Here's the thing, this word is actually used multiple times throughout the New Testament, but there's only two times it's not used in a negative way, here and in Jude 1, uh, verse three. Every other time, koinos is translated as either unclean or unholy. It's abrasive because it means that you are removing the sacredness of what's there. And so Luke is intentionally using an abrasive term to get people's attention as they would read and understand what happened as the church was beginning, as this faith community was forming. Because here's what he's saying. He's saying, as these people were together, as the believers gathered together, they had all things in common. Here's what he's saying. That everything was removed. There was nothing special about this group. Nothing differentiated them. All their ideas, practices, religions, faiths that were before their heritage, lineage, all of it didn't matter because when they came to this point at the cross, at the cross, they had all things in common. They had all things in common. I couldn't get past this because I felt, oh, do I have a common unity with those that I am in community with. Because here they did. Everything that would have divided them, put them into different groups and organizations and class structures, it's all removed. All specialness has been removed. No one is special here. We are all on common ground at the cross because only one is actually special. And because of what Jesus did, we come to that place and we have all things in common. That, man, that changes everything. A Christ-centered community, it changes everything because what it means is all are included. And see, back in the day, there weren't a lack of institutions and religious organizations. They had plenty of stuff going on. You have Rome, so you've got politics. You've got different faith-based things. There's a bunch of different temples. You have the praetoriums with the military standards, slave, master, you know, man, woman. I mean, there's just, there's every way that we could exclude people, and every group did that. You have the Stoics and the philosophers that were checking education, and it didn't, maybe like your social status, or maybe how much you made. All these things would exclude you from one group or another. And what marks Christianity as different from historians and what they write, Tom Holland in his book, Dominion, uh, Tom Holland, the author, not actor, writes about the early church. He says, what marks them as different is inclusivity. Come as you are was the motto. Now, Jesus is gonna mess you up. He's gonna, he's gonna do some things. But at the front, there was common unity because we're all on common ground at the cross. And so all all have been invited in. And I find that profoundly challenging. Do we see, do we live out a common unity right now in our relationships, in our church, in my life group, in my circles? Like this is for me, this is for us. Because this became something that they were known for. Lake City, as a church, in our community, are we known for this? This was hard for me. And so something unique is going on because there's a common unity. And so Luke continues, verse 46. And day by day, attending the, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This example here is so incredible that they were meeting in the temples and they were meeting in the homes. Here's the thing, you're already winning in some degree because by being here, you're engaging in community in a large way. That there was a, a marked difference that the church would gather in large groups. But then there's also the other side, that they would gather in small groups, that there was a meaningful practice of breaking bread, again, it references it here, of communion together. 
There was a common unity that was taking place. And it says that because of this, they had favor with all people. Favor with all people. I can't even comprehend that. Can you imagine, again, in our community, having favor with all people? You know, I, I love it when I'm able to be out in the community and, and I'll strike up a conversation with somebody and we'll talk about church. And when they talk about Lake City and, and they say like, oh, you know what, I love Lake City. I went to this thing or I was a part of this thing or I know this person or I got to be a part of the food bank in this way. I'm gonna be honest, it makes me smile because I know, like Mitch said, when we're giving, we're doing things. We are engaged in our community. We are engaged as a church and I love the idea, but it is such a challenge to, to remain fixated on this idea that as we love one another, as we are dedicated to the rhythms and routines that are here, that we would have favor with all people. Andy Stanley, a, a pastor and, and author, uh, said this a number of years ago. I got to hear him. He said, imagine a world where people were skeptical of what we believed, but envious of how well we treated one another. Imagine in a world where people who were skeptical of what we believed were envious of how well we treated one another. That sticks out to me profoundly because of this. You know, when I was growing up, I, was, I grew up in the church, and I was often told, like, you just have to invite your friends to church. You just have to invite your friends to church. Invite your friends to church. And yet what we see here as the Holy Spirit empowers these people to be a true Christ-centered community and as they are meeting day after day and as people are being, numbered to their, uh, people are being added to their numbers day after day, it wasn't programs that they set up and like evangelistic routines. They didn't have to like put up the tent and like have a revival. No, by the way they were treating one another, by the love they had within the church, it itself was its own example an evangelistic opportunity because other people saw and they were like, I need that. I wanna be a part of that. And the history of the early church is marked by those moments. And here's the thing. Lake City has been marked by those moments. We have had, I've only been here three and a half years, and yet we have had so many incredible moments of life change. We have seen not only like Nick's story this morning, but we continue to just see Jesus changing people, bringing them into a Christ-centered community that we get to share in. And that means it's a celebration for all of us. About, um, about a year and a half ago, I met a kid for the first time, and I don't usually remember <laughs> the first time I meet kids because there's a lot coming in and out of the other building. But this kid uh, came in with a, with a full arm cast. So, you know, it kind of stands out. Okay, what happened? And um, I met Ezra for the first time that morning. And he is a bright and bubbly kid. And at that point in time, Ezra had been uh, removed from the home he was in. It was an unhealthy situation. And so uh, Jackie and I began to learn a little bit more about his story as he began coming to kids' church. And I'm gonna be honest with you, at first, there were some challenges. This guy's got a lot of energy, and he wasn't used to, you know, some of the things we do. And so during worship, there was a lot of escaping, and during the teaching time, there was a lot of hiding. And yet, over the course of about a year, we just began to see all of these, like, little steps, these little steps in a direction to where Ezra began to be involved, to be a part of worship. He'd sit and he'd listen to the teaching. He'd be a part of small groups, the crafts and activities and the questions that would take place. And um, it, was about, uh, it was about six months ago. I'll never forget. Ezra sometimes beats his family in the doors. And he came running in the front doors. He says, Andrew. He's <laughs> loud. He goes, Andrew, Andrew, I'm gonna be adopted. And I just got down, gave him a huge high five. I was like, dude, that's so exciting. How exciting is that? I can't imagine, I can't imagine how his story's unfolded. And so, you can imagine how excited I was two weeks ago when I got the email that Ezra Yoakum was signed up to be dedicated this morning. And it was a moment where I was like, man, 
Kim, who opened her home as a small community, we've opened up this as a larger community, that we've gotten to be a part of a story that's unfolding. And so I thought it'd be appropriate. I wanted to invite Ezra up to the stage, and I just wanted to ask him a couple questions about community. Come on up, bud. How are you doing this morning? Doing good? You doing good? Yes. <laughs> Hold it up here. Yep, there you go. Ezra, how did it feel when you found out you were going to be adopted? Great. It's great. <laughs> okay. What did it mean for you when you were invited into this community? When was the first time that you felt accepted here at church in this community? Mm. The third time I came. The third time? That's, that's pretty good. I mean, that's pretty good. What was it about that that made you feel welcome? That I finally figured out what this church does. Uh-huh. And, and how it works. Yeah. Are there some people that helped you feel invited here at church? Yes. Who would be some of those, like in the kids' area? My siblings, Mm -hmm. Miss Jackie, and you. Oh, I I didn't tell them to say that. (laughs) (laughs) Ezra, you know, it's so great to be a part of your story, but how would you encourage us as a church to be a part of community? Is there a way you could encourage us to engage in community, to be a part of community in a bigger way? What was something that helped you feel a part of community? Does anything come to mind? Does anything come to mind? No? But you have so much to say in kids' church. I feel like... (laughs) How could you be short on words now? (laughs) You have a great smile, though. How how could you encourage, what would you say to the church to be a part of community? Mm. Can I share with them what you told me? Yes, exactly. Share it with them. So, mm, welcoming people to the church like teaching them what we do and how the program works. That's awesome. Ezra, I appreciate you so much. And I want you to know, buddy, that you have a spot in this community. You're a part of this now. You get that? Yeah. Love you, bud. (laughs) Head down to Mark. It's life change. When we engage in Christ-centered community, we make space for anyone. It doesn't matter what's happened. It doesn't matter your past, where you've come from. Like we saw in the early church, everyone's welcome here. And my hope this morning, my prayer, is that as we see how the early church engaged in a Christ-centered community, that we also would be challenged, that we could look at our own lives and say, okay, God, where is it that I need to better engage in community? So what we've been doing with this series is you've got a red sticky note. And this morning, I just, I have three questions. And my hope with this is that maybe we can identify what it is for us. So maybe you take notes on your phone or maybe you have a pen to write this down, but our first question is this. What is one obstacle that is keeping you from engaging in community? You know, I mentioned earlier there's time. I always feel like there's time constraints. I feel like our home, we have three boys. It's always a mess. And I feel like 
we're inviting people into our mess. And you want to set a good example, but man, it's hard. So what's one example? What's an obstacle? Second question is this. What would represent a step towards community? So what would represent a step in that direction of overcoming that obstacle? For me, that idea of time, of what I'm giving my time to and how I'm prioritizing always comes to the front. Because here's the thing, I've, I've seen my own life, I've, I've worked with enough peop, people, we're always gonna prioritize what we value most. And so, what would represent that step? And the last one's this. The third one is what is a name? Is there a name of somebody you could reach out to? Is there a name of somebody you could invite into your home? Maybe there's a family that you could invite into your home. That idea, like, was modeled in the early church. Maybe that's not feasible, though. Maybe it's going out to coffee. Or maybe it's that somebody had mentioned something difficult going on in their life, but you need to follow back up with them. So what's a name? And then here's how we're gonna, we're gonna close. I've never done this before. This might be a terrible idea. But I'm gonna ask each of us, we're gonna bow our heads and I'd ask that you pull out your phone. Some of you do this anyway, so this is just normal routine. I'm gonna ask that you bow your head and pull out your phone. That name you wrote down, I'd encourage you to text it right now. Send a text, hey, I was thinking about you, we should grab coffee soon. Hey, what would it look like to have your family over in the next couple weeks? Set a date. I'm gonna close this in prayer. And as I'm praying, feel free to keep texting that person. Because what I'm gonna be praying is that we would engage in Christ-centered community that we would be the greatest example of Jesus to the people we're around and that those outside would be added to our number daily. Let's pray. God, this morning, we just give you the glory because God, lives are being changed and the stories that are lining up, these just couldn't happen without you. And so God, I thank you for allowing us to be a part of it. But God, I also pray that you would challenge each of us to self-reflect and to look at our lives and say, okay, how am I engaging in community? And God, is there a greater way that I can be a part of community, be an example of a Christ-centered community? And so God, I pray right now for the names that have been written down. God, I pray that we would set dates, that we would meet with people, that we would check in on each other. God, that we would take to heart Acts 2, 42 through 47 and understand that we should be committed to teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers. God, that we are committed to one another. The idea of giving up the comforts of ourselves, the selling our, even our own possessions to make sure the needs are met for those around us. God, that we would be the greatest example to the world around us because of the community that we find in being a part of the church. And I pray that over each of us this morning, in Jesus' name, amen.